Hello. Welcome to um, our lecture today. We are talking about energy in the atmosphere. This is chapter 15.3, the third section of our chapter. There are only four sections, so that means the test will be next week. Just keep preparing. By the time... By the time we get done, you should be able to describe how Earth, her energy is transmitted. You should be able to describe Earth's heat budget and what happens to the sun's energy. Discuss the importance of convection in the atmosphere and describe how a planet's heat budget can be balanced. So hopefully by now you know that the amount of the sun's energy that reaches our planet is not even all over our planet. Um, as you can tell by this picture up here, the sun hits most directly at the equator. So it gets most of the sun's energy and then it spreads out more as it hits either the North Pole or the South Pole, um, meaning that they get less of the sun's energy. Remember that insolation with an O is the amount of solar radiation that reaches a given area in a given time. So because the equator gets more of the sun's radiation, the, sun, the equator has a higher insolation than the poles do. That difference in the amount of insulation is what gives us most of our weather. So let's talk about those energy waves because the energy travels in electromagnetic waves. Um, if you transfer energy through electromagnetic waves, it's called radiation. You should already know this. Uh, we talked about it when we talked about the layers of the earth. Um, so hopefully you remember that. This is applying it a little bit more to our atmosphere now. Instead of radiating from the core to the magma, um, we're going to radiate into different layers of the atmosphere. Different wavelengths of energy are going to create different types of electromagnetic waves. I'm going to study those for just a minute. We can only see this. This here is what the electromagnetic spectrum would look like. We can only see this teeny tiny part right here um, of that spectrum, and we call that visible light. The longest wavelengths of visible light are going to appear red. So when you see red, you're seeing longer wavelengths. Beyond that, we have infrared. We can't see infrared, but we do feel it because infrared um, feels like heat. That's where a lot of the heat comes from. The shortest wavelength then is on the opposite end of the visible life, light spectrum. It is violet, so we see it as violet, or some people call it purple. Beyond violet, the next one is ultraviolet. Uh, a lot of people don't know that the moon and the planets don't make their own light. Uh, I think that's very interesting that people don't know that, but they don't. Earth the moon and all the other planets, just like Earth, doesn't make its own light. We reflect the light from the sun. Well, that's great unless you don't know what reflection means. So reflection is when a wave hits a surface and then bounces back. Albedo or albedo is a measure of how well a surface reflects light. So a mirror or a field of snow would have really high albedo while something like asphalt or dull rocks would have a really low albedo because they don't reflect a lot of light.
The law of conservation of energy says that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So as much as some people may think they're making energy, they're not. They're just changing it. When energy is changed, it almost always gives off some heat. And that heat will always, always, always transfer from hot to cold. It will never, ever, ever go cold to hot. Heat is always transferred from hot to cold. Remember that heat measures a material's total energy. It's all of the energy of all of the atoms. While temperature measures how fast those atoms in a material are moving. So it measures more of an individual atom. How fast is, are those atoms moving? So in your flex, but it, it has a great example that, that says the temperature of a candle flame. If you light a candle, the temperature of that candle flame is going to be higher than if I run a tub of really hot water. Temperature of the candle is going to be higher. But the heat of that candle is going to be lower than the bathtub heat because there aren't as many atoms in that candle flame. The temperature of the bathtub would be lower, but the heat amount would be more, would be greater. So it would have more heat because there are more atoms in that bathtub of water. I hope that makes sense. Latent heat is the heat that is taken in or released as a as a material changes state. Great example of this is this water molecule or this, these things of water. As a substance is changing state, it doesn't increase temperature, it doesn't decrease temperature until that change is complete. So if I start to um, melt this ice cube, that ice cube is going to stay 32 degrees until it is completely melted. Once it is completely melted, then the temperature of it would go up until it hits its boiling point. Then it's going to stay, that water is going to stay the same temperature as long as it is changing um, the latent heat of vaporization, as long as it's becoming water vapor. Okay? So why doesn't the heat increase? Why doesn't the temperature increase? Even if I increase the heat, why doesn't the temperature increase? Because the substance is using the latent heat, the heat that is being put into it. So the heat that is being put into this ice cube, not going to raise the temperature of the ice cube, even though the ice cube is melting. It's going to use that energy to turn it into liquid water to change its state. Specific heat is the amount of energy that is required to raise the temperature of a substance one degree Celsius, which is about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is kind of important because different substances have different specific heats. Water has a really high specific heat. So it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water. You know this if you think about it, because if you go out on a really hot summer day right after it's rained, um, while there's still puddles out here, but the it's been hot, so the streets are still hot, if you step in a puddle of water, you're going to notice that it's cooler than if you stand on the asphalt of the street. Why? Because water has a higher specific heat. It takes more to raise the temperature of that water than asphalt does. Asphalt has a relatively low specific heat. So it doesn't take as much energy 
to raise the temperature of that asphalt. So it's going to get hotter faster. Hopefully by now you also know that Earth gets most of its energy from the sun. Um, ultraviolet wavelengths have the most energy, and that's what most of the energy that we get is. But only, um, it only makes up about 7% of all the solar radiation. So there are other kinds, obviously we've talked about those, um, of solar radiation. There are actually three forms of ultraviolet or UV wavelengths. There is UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVC has the highest amount of energy of all of the ultraviolet, uh, but it doesn't reach Earth's surface at all because it gets absorbed or reflected, I mean, by the Earth's top part of Earth's atmosphere. So it never even makes it down to the surface. The second highest energy is UVB. It has, it's mostly stopped in the atmosphere, but not completely. This is what, if you have lizards um, or reptiles, a lot of them need UVB light in order to digest their food properly and in order to live. That's why you have to get special bulbs for reptiles. UVA has the lowest amount of energy and it will travel right through the atmosphere to the ground. I know it doesn't sound like it should. You would think that the higher amounts of energy would make it farther, but that doesn't happen. UVA is what actually will go all the way through our atmosphere to the ground. 44% of solar radiation is visible light. This gets us up to 51% altogether. Um, when it's all together, you probably know that visible light is white, but you also know that it can be broken apart into its different wavelengths by using a prism, and then you see the rainbow colors. Um, or when it hits water molecules uh, in the atmosphere, we get rainbows. The other 49% of solar radi radiation is in the form of infrared wavelengths. We cannot see infrared just like we can't see ultraviolet unless we use special cameras or special equipment. This picture of the, the pupper over on the left shows uh, the infrared wavelengths coming off of this particular dog. They come off in the form of heat and that's what infrared equipment picks up. It actually picks up the heat. So we don't see the infrared, but we feel it as heat. Again, different parts of Earth get different amounts of solar radiation. We already said that the equator gets the most and the poles get the least. Uh, this is just kind of an example. It kind of shows you how the solar radiation comes from the sun and it spreads out as it travels so that most, if you look, it hits most directly at the equator right here. It's almost a straight line, but then as it's moving up toward one of the poles, it has to spread out and it covers a larger area because of the shape of our planet. Different parts of Earth get different amounts of sunlight, also depending on the season, because our planet's axis is not straight up and down. Our planet's axis isn't like this. It's tilted. Uh, as it circles the sun. The tilt is actually on a 23.5 degree uh, tilt and it points toward the North Star, which is also called Polaris. Now, hopefully you remember that Earth revolves around the sun once a year. It takes a whole year for our Earth to make its trip around the sun, but it rotates on its axis once per day, revolves around the sun rotates on its axis. As Earth revol revolves, the axis will always stay lined up with Polaris. It's always going to be pointed toward the North Star. 
So different parts of Earth get different amount of sunlight depending on the season also. Again, this is because of the tilt of our planet as it circles the sun. During our summer, which is going to be over here, if you notice our hemisphere, which by the way, we are in the northern hemisphere. That means we are in the northern half of our planet. Our hemisphere is tilted more toward the sun. So the sun's rays are going to hit directly at the Tropic of Cancer, which is 23 degrees north on June 22nd, which is the summer solstice. Um, we're going to have more daylight and less night, and that's what our summer is. As we are having summer in the northern hemisphere, if you look on this picture, you can see that the southern hemisphere is pointed away from the sun. So it's going to be winter in the southern hemisphere. During our winter over here, the hem our hemisphere, the northern hemisphere again, is tilted away from the sun. The sun is going to hit directly at the Tropic of Capricorn, which is 23 and a half degrees south latitude. We're going to have shorter days and longer nights. The longest night will be on December 22nd, which is the winter solstice. From December 22nd on, like now, our nights are getting shorter and our days are getting longer. As we are experiencing winter, notice that the southern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun, so they are experiencing their summer. Halfway between the two solstices, solstices, solstice, I don't know how you pronounce that word, or between each solstice, that's better, we have the two equinoxes. These are going to occur either on September 22nd or 23rd for the autumnal equinox, which is when we'd go into fall, and March 21st or 22nd for the vernal equinox, which is when we go into spring. The sun hits the equator most directly. This is where it's going to hit straight on at the equator. We have equal amounts of day and night. So in March, our days are starting to get longer from December to March. We have um, equal amounts of day and night. And then we're going to have more and more and more light time, more and more and more day until we hit June 22nd. And then it's going to start getting less until we get to September 23rd, where we have equal amounts again and continue to get less until we hit December 22nd where we have the shortest amount of day and longest amount of night. So how does heat travel through our atmosphere? It travels through the same, the same three ways that it moves through our planet. Uh, just like we have three ways that it moves through our Earth's layers, it moves through our atmosphere the exact same three ways. Radiation, it radiates from the sun that's where the heat transfers through electromagnetic waves, just like it comes from the sun to us. You can also think of a fire. Um, you don't have to be touching the fire in order for you to feel its heat. Uh, it's not traveling in a circle where it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The energy is just coming out from the fire. So it radiates from the fire. Conduction is when heat is transferred from hot to cold through direct contact. Just like if you pick up a hot, a cup of hot chocolate or hot coffee. Um, if you touch a, a glass that is not insulated or a cup that is not insulated, you can feel that heat. You can burn your hand on the cup because, not because you're touching the actual hot thing, the hot chocolate, but because the heat has transferred from the hot chocolate to the cup while it's touching and then when you touch that it's going to burn your hand it's going to transfer to your hand remember it will always go from hot to cold 
Convection is when heat is transferred by the movement of the heat particles, just like magma, um, like we've talked already about several times uh, in that convection current where hot stuff rises, cold stuff sinks, and that's the convection current. So about half the solar radiation that hits the top of our atmosphere is absorbed by gases or it's reflected by the clouds or it's scattered into space. So about half of the solar radiation that hits our, our atmosphere never hits the surface. It never comes down far enough to, for us to worry about. 3% of the waves that hit the surface hit the surface of our planet and then because of the albedo of whatever is on our surface it's reflected back up into the atmosphere. Um, think of being in a swimming pool and how even though your body is underneath the water your face can get sunburned because that sunlight is hitting the water and reflecting back onto your face. The rest of the rest, which is about 47%, is absorbed by things on the planet, like rocks, like soil, water, buildings, people. And then it's radiated back into the atmosphere as heat. So solar radiation is constantly coming into our atmosphere. That kind of makes sense because the sun is always shining somewhere. So if that happens, why isn't Earth heating up really fast? Well, the reason that we aren't heating up really fast is because we have about the same amount of energy is leaving our planet through the atmosphere, the top part of the atmosphere, as, it, as the amount that is coming into our planet. So we say that we have a balanced heat budget. Our heat budget is how much heat, it's just like your money budget, how much comes in and how much goes out. So how much heat enters our planet and how much heat and energy exit our planet. And we have pretty much a balanced heat budget because we have about the same amount leaving as we have coming in. Of course, there's always that exception because this is science. Uh, and this is where people get really worried about the greenhouse effect because we know that greenhouse gases warm our atmosphere. They trap in the heat from our atmosphere as those little particles get excited in our atmosphere and are bumping into each other. The greenhouse gases um, hold that heat in. They also trap the heat that is radiating from Earth in the troposphere. Kind of like a blanket. If you get cold, what do you do? You put a blanket on. Why? To hold the heat in to your that is reflecting off of your body. Or radiating, I mean, off of your body. So the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are what actually determine Earth's temperature. If we have too little greenhouse gases, not enough of them, we're going to freeze because we wouldn't have enough heat staying here on our planet. It would all be going off into some pla into space. If we have too much, then our planet overheats. Now, that's not a problem or hasn't been a problem for many, many, many years because humans weren't around and there were natural forms of greenhouse gases that were regulated. Then humans came onto the scene, and since the Industrial Revolution, we have increased the amount of natural greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane, and we've created new ones like chlorofluoro chlorofluorocarbons. I like to say it. It's fun, but it's also kind of a tongue tangler. Chlorofluorocarbons. Chlorofluorocarbons. Um, and the new ones that we have created seem to trap more heat than 
the natural greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. So the more greenhouse gases there are in the atmosphere, the hotter Earth becomes. Well, as Earth gets hotter, that means our climate and our weather begin to change. We have things like our ice caps are melting, uh, which is creating more water and flooding some places that weren't flooded before. It also can cause extinctions to begin to happen, like polar bears are on the verge of extinction because the ice caps that they would usually rest on or even live on sometimes are melting and they're having to swim too far from ice cap to ice cap and some of them are drowning and they don't have places to hunt for their food. So um, that's it for this chapter or this section of the chapter, I should say, sorry. Um, make sure that you have answered all of the questions. Make sure that you review your vocabulary if you have not already done so. You should do that almost on a daily basis. The test will be probably Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe later part of next week. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day.